Hello, and welcome to our Adobe Premiere Pro overview. Um, I'm going to cover the kind of like a nice basic run through of everything you're going to need to know to get started and have a good foundational knowledge of Adobe Premiere. Uh, it is a deep program. There's a lot you can get into, but um, these are the topics we're going to cover. We're going to start with media management because this is a crucial thing. Before you even open Premiere, you need to make sure your media is organized and in a secure place. And then we're going to run through setting up a new project, the interface, the tools, three-point editing, which is more of a process and a technique that you will use, and then how to add effects, and finally how to export. Let's first talk about media management. Um, so... If you're using a certain type of DSLR, like the Sony Alpha, you're gonna get a whole bunch of files. And this is an approximation of what you might pull off of the card. Um, and you'll notice down here in private, under MP4 root, under clip, you'll find the MP4 files. And these are really all you need. Um, it's good to grab all this stuff off the card, but once you have this, you can do one of two things. You can keep it all if you want, but it takes up a lot of space. Um, what I would recommend is just grabbing the MP4 files and putting them into, uh, like dragging them out of here and putting them onto your desktop, for instance. Um, I'm gonna, I'll let you kind of figure that out, but what I've done already is gathered a bunch of videos in this manner. I've grabbed the MP4 files, and you also notice I've named them. Now this is super helpful, and I would recommend some kind of basic, simple nomenclature that's gonna help you when you're in Premiere and you're looking at these clips, and you're gonna see like, oh, this is an extreme long shot of bikes um, versus just a random string of numbers. So go ahead and do that. I've already established that. But another key part of media management is like where your files are living. Because once you import them into Premiere, you do not wanna move them. So what I would recommend is um, putting them in a place that's maybe not your desktop. For instance, I would recommend your documents folder. You might go ahead and make a new folder in here and call it the name of your project. And so like, I'll call this editing demo and I like to not use spaces. And I might even gonna, uh, you know, let's call it editing demo and then it popped up there. And I'll open it and it's empty. And what I'm gonna do is just inside that, I'm gonna just put this folder. So it's no longer on my desktop. It's now, if you look at the file path in my documents, editing demo, uh, and then editing demo vids in here. And then for instance, what I can do is also make a new folder here that's going to be called uh, maybe like audio or music because you might want some music files as well. And I've already downloaded um, a folder or a, a music file called uh, well, it's a song, uh, and I downloaded it off YouTube. So I'm just going to move it over into the music area. So now I've got in my music, I've got this, and I've got all my videos, MP4s. Um, now, what I would also recommend is make another folder and call, oops, but put it over in your uh, main area. And I'm going to suggest calling this Premiere. And this will make more sense, but Premiere is going to generate a bunch of files, and we want to just have them separate in this special folder. So you can kind of see what I'm doing here. Now you've got um, everything you're working with inside this one folder. So for instance, if you wanted to back it up to an external hard drive, you just drag this one folder onto your external hard drive and stash it. But I'm going to not do that right now because I don't really have much in there, but like that might be something you want to do. So I'm going to close this. So that's media management. Take a minute, go ahead and do that, and then go ahead and open Premiere. Um, cool. So when you open Premiere for the first time, uh, you have a few options. You can open up, you can kind of keep working on a project you've got, or you can make a new project. So we're gonna make a new project. So go ahead and click that. This is one of the habits you should get in. Okay, when you get a new project going, you wanna give it a name. So let's call this like, visual continuity project, or if you, your project has a name, again, I'm gonna call mine demo, editing demo, because I, uh, you know, I'm not making a visual continuity project. 
And then another thing I want to kind of point out here is location. This is where you're saving that. And you'll notice mine is going to a, uh, like this file path. And that's because the last time I used Premiere, I was working on a project and this was the file path. So it defaults to what you used last time. So let's hit browse. And now this is where we're going to go and find the folder that we just made. So mine's called editing demo. It's in the documents. And this is where I'm going to put my Premiere folder into use. And I'm going to choose that. And now all the files I generate using Premiere are going into that specific folder. So that way you're going to have um, everything kind of organized nice and neat. And I know this is boring, but um, it's super important. And uh, this stuff really shouldn't have to be changed by you. But one thing to check is the scratch disks tab. And these should all say same as project. And they do. Um, and what we're doing right now is called setting our scratch disks, which is a fancy way to say, where are you saving things in Premiere? So once we've done that, Premiere opens up. And let me just fix something real quick. Uh, right now I'm at, uh, working on um, a setup with two monitors. And so I have that saved. But I'm going to go back and just change my window, my workspace layout to editing. And this is probably what yours is going to look like. This is a good default workspace editing. But you'll notice you can change these. Uh, and that's what these are up here. If you wanted to like have a slightly different um, layout, you can select those up here. But I'm going to say stick with editing. That's a really kind of good one to work with. So we've opened Premiere. We've given it a name. And we've saved it. And now it's open. So the first thing we want to do is we want to import our media because what Premiere is going to do is it's going to work with the files we tell it to, right? And so Command I or File Import is how you import media. Some people like to drag and drop things, move it around, but I'm a kind of advocate for this sort of um, not engaging in drag and drop actions with Premiere. Just sometimes it's a little bit easier. So let's go ahead and import our footage first. And now this is where our nice organized media management comes into play. So I'm going to find the editing demo. And what do I want to import? I want to import the videos and the music. I do not want to import my Premiere file because that's redundant. I'm in Premiere already. So I'm just going to hit Shift and select both of these things and then press Import. One benefit to having my stuff organized before I import it is you can see it's already in folders and this might come in handy. Things are a little bit nice and neat. So, all right. So before we start working, I just want to point out the basic layout here of Premiere. Uh, there's four kind of main windows and you'll see that um, inside each window, sometimes there's multiple tabs here. Um, so this is what you might call your source window. And this is where your clips like if you want to preview a clip, you would pull it up there. So if I, for instance, open this ELS shot, this is just a preview. Sorry, this is a, the audio scrubbing. Um, but so you can preview your clips this way, right? So that's your source window. In here, this is your program window. This is going to be your final version. Um, but right now it's empty because I'm not working on anything. Down here is our timeline. Now this is where you kind of start to assemble and edit your clips. This is going to be where you do a lot of your work. And then over here, we have what's called the project window or the browser. And this is where we like have all the clips in the media we're working with, including our music and when we make titles and other things. Um, and inside this window, there's also a bunch of other tabs. And in Premiere, because there's a lot of space, a lot of stuff crammed into this small space, and you see this little arrow here, um, that just tells you all the tabs you have, right? And I really don't use my media browser tab. So if I right click on this, I can close this panel because I don't need it. And now it's gone. I'm also going to just do that with my libraries because really the main thing I'm going to be using here is my effects and my project 
like bin, if you will. Um, everything else I can just leave. So there we have it. We've imported our clips and there they are. Uh, the next thing we wanna do is we wanna set up a sequence inside of our timeline. The timeline is the window and you'll notice it says drop media here to create a sequence. Before we get to that, I just wanna show you the kind of professional, maybe productive way to start a sequence, to make a new sequence. And if you go up here under File, New, Sequence, or Command N, this is gonna set up some uh, settings for us in our timeline. And this is gonna be like a thing we do every time we start a new project. But within a project, you can have multiple sequences. And I'll show you what I mean. But first, let's make our first sequence this window. It's a little intimidating, um, but that's okay. But basically, you may have heard of codecs. Um, those are compression, decompression standards that every kind of media file has. And with video, codecs are really important. So what we want to do is choose the file format or codec that we're working with. If you shot with a Sony Alpha, um, you may remember this string of random letters, AVCHD. That is the file format that the Sony Alpha uses. So if I twirl this down, I can find a bunch of options. So this is where like knowing that the file format you shot with, um, having that handy is gonna be really helpful. So I know that I shot with 1080p, which is full HD. And I also know that I shot with 30 frames per second. You may not remember this and that's fine. Um, if you want, you can go to your, uh, you can go look at your clips, for instance, and um, if I look at my documents and I find editing demo and I look at my videos, if I open one up in QuickTime and I go to file, no, sorry, view, no, window, sorry, Show Movie Inspector or Command I, which is how I know it. It gives you this information and it tells you that you shot with 30 frames per second and this is your uh, 1920 by 1080 like video setting. So that's just something to keep in mind. I'm gonna close that, but um, I know that I shot with 30 frames per second. So I'm gonna choose that. And I'm gonna name this uh, kind of like, uh, you can leave it at sequence one, but like my movie might be good. Um, if you shot with a different type of camera, uh, there's a few options, but digital SLR is always an interesting one. Um, same thing, same principles apply, knowing what uh, resolution you shot at and then what frame rate is really helpful. Um, there's so many codecs and resolutions these days, uh, it gets confusing. And if you're not sure, don't worry about it. Choose something that you think is close enough. I would say, when in doubt, digital SLR 30 or 24 frames per second, 1080p is always a good one, unless you like knowing your resolution. And this is where like your responsibility comes in, knowing your footage. But I'm gonna stick with the Sony setting for AVC HD, 1080p, 30 frames per second, click okay. And you'll notice down here in my project window, my sequence appears. It also appears in my timeline. So this is where, for instance, you can have multiple sequences. Um, and that's okay. So for instance, I'm gonna make a new sequence again, and I'm gonna use the digital SLR setting just to see what happens. And I'm gonna call this, just real quick, test. And now we see two sequences down there, and they each have a tab. So I'm just gonna close that for now and come back here. So, all right, there we have kind of setting up a new project. Um, our videos are in here. Uh, we're ready to, to edit. I'm gonna show you a few things that might help you real quick. Um, Premiere is pretty cramped. So I would recommend hiding your doc. See, I got my doc hidden, keep that out of the way. And always sort of like make Premiere full screen. Uh, and this idea of like, when you're trying to move around windows, um, moving, dragging Premiere around can be a little confusing. So a nice hot tip is Command Tab brings up this interface. So if you're, for instance, trying to go between Premiere and maybe like a web browser because you're watching a tutorial or you're going and taking notes, 
you can just kind of command tab between programs. It's really a helpful tip. All right. So here we are in Premiere. There's a lot of keyboard shortcuts that are going to help you find your way around. And I would recommend starting to learn those over time. Um, but for instance, if you ever want to know if you mouse over an area, it tells you the name of the thing oftentimes and the, the keyboard shortcut. So for instance, this is the razor blade tool and you can activate it by hitting the C button, right? And now I have a razor blade, but nothing to cut. So your main tool here is the selection tool. This is basically the cursor. This is what allows you to drag and move things around. It's going to be super helpful. Um, there's a bunch of other tools here that we'll kind of tap into. And you'll notice that a lot of tools, if you hold down, have multiple options, like other options hidden underneath. So for instance, my ripple edit tool is also where I find my rate stretch tool. And this might be helpful if you're trying to slow down or speed up clips. This rate stretch tool, or R, is very handy. All right, um, so you get the idea here. Um, the pen tool is a very, very helpful tool. We're going to go over that in a minute here. The hand tool, uh, I don't really use it that often in, in Photoshop, but, or sorry, in um, Premiere, it's more of a Photoshop thing for me. But... Um, and this is the type tool, and this is how you add text really easily. Um, so this is your core kind of toolkit that you're going to be using nestled in here. Um, another window that you probably see right now but isn't activated is your audio meter right over here, your VU meter. And this shows you the audio level when you're playing your audio. Um, Obviously you're hearing things on your speaker, but this audio meter is gonna be super important for kind of doing mixing work and making sure your sound levels are pretty consistent and sort of um, throughout your video. Uh, and you'll start to get more and more into these as you go. So, all right. So, here we have it, the editing demo. All my clips in here, I'm just double clicking the kind of icon area here and you'll notice the reason I was encouraging you to name your clips is because look they've maintained their name so now I know what everything is and that is very helpful to me um, all right let's see what else do we got here um, you'll notice a lot of little things going on um, one thing here this set of numbers I just want to point it out it's called time code and what we're looking at is for instance um, on the right hand side, this tells us how long our clip is. So this is a 31 second clip and 15 frames long clip. And for every clip you click, you kind of have that information here. All right, um, so let me show you something else as we get started. So my movie, this is the sequence that I started and I specifically chose because I knew I was using Sony Alpha footage. Um, but a quick test to see if you chose the right settings would be to kind of just like take any clip and literally just drag it in to your sequence and see what happens. So for me right now, it loaded in there and I can see uh, what's going on um, and it looks good. Um, I didn't get a warning message, and that's a sign that says my video sequence here in Premiere matches the clip that I put in there. So there's no mismatched data. Like, for instance, if my clip was a different frame rate, I might get an error message. So let me show you what that might look like, because it's also a helpful way, if you're feeling really lost and confused, to just get the right settings without knowing all the mumbo-jumbo like language and technical info. So I'm going to open up this test sequence which I made as a DSLR sequence. Um, and up here, up top, we have your typical Mac style menu, which is where so many things are tucked away. And just kind of knowing the sort of like logic of Premiere is gonna be very helpful. So for instance, the file menu heading has a lot of important things such as making new uh, sequences, finding 
like adding black video, um, adding color, things like, like a color map, just like a solid color, things like that. Um, a lot of information's up here. But another important part up here is sequence. And under sequence settings, if I click this button, it basically shows me all the info that I can't tell just by looking at Premiere's interface. This tells me the editing mode, so it's a DSLR. It tells me the time frame, time base, like 30 frames per second. It shows me how my, how with the, the as, pixel aspect ratios, so full HD, shows me the aspect ratio. It shows me a lot of things that maybe don't make much sense to us right now. But, so if you're ever kind of wondering like, oh, what, what did I set my sequence settings to? This is one way to tell. So, this is the DSLR sequence, which is gonna be different than the clips I'm using. Now watch what happens when I take a clip and I just drop it in here. Oh, I didn't get the message, the error message. Um, and maybe that's because it's close enough. Um, let me try something real quick. Let's make a new sequence. I'm trying to do it wrong and choose, let me just choose like, like something totally wrong. Let's say you go into this Canon XF MPEG-2 um, and you're choosing like a sequence or accidentally, uh, and I'll call this test02, and I'll open that up. Um, now when I drag a clip in there, I get this. This is what I wanted. Clip mismatch warning. So this is a warning saying, this clip does not match the sequence settings. Should I change the sequence to match the clip? And this can be a really helpful thing where yes, let's change the sequence to match the clip because that's always the goal. You wanna have your sequence and your clips match, all right? So that can be a good thing, so keep that in mind. So I'm just gonna close that. I'm actually gonna delete it because I don't even want that. And I just, to delete something in Premiere, you just click and delete, hit the delete button and that's it. I'm also gonna delete this other test one. So now the only sequence left is my My Movie one. And I'm just gonna, um, come over here to my move selection tool, V, and I'm just gonna select that and delete it because I don't want that in there. All right, so I wanna talk about, now that you've got Premiere set up, your sequence settings should be matching your clip settings, you're ready to start editing. Um, and I wanna stress how important that first part is, this media management and technical, like, correctness <laughs> um, because it will cause you problems on the road if you're like about to export your movie and you realize you're working in the wrong sequence settings that can be quite a problem um, but now that we've got our proper sequence settings and we kind of know our basic tools here let's start the process of editing so in my sequence here this this thing that, that I'm kind of dragging around this is called the playhead and this is if I kind of zoom in um, by dragging this or zoom out, it shows me frame by frame accuracy what image I'm at, right? And you can kind of zoom in and zoom out of the sequence. You can see the time code, like now I'm like one, two, three, four, five frames, right? That's uh, super zoomed in. And here we're zooming out, and I'm just gonna go back to the beginning. Um, and you'll notice defaulting your sequence, your timeline is gonna have three video tracks and six audio tracks. And that's, the reason for that is because um, it's seldom to just simply use one track when we edit, start editing, you'll see what I mean. But usually when you're editing audio, um, each video clip is gonna have potentially two audio tracks, a stereo set. One is gonna be the left and one is gonna be the right. So um, we just wanna make sure that we're kind of knowing what's up here. And inside the sequence settings, uh, or sorry, inside your sequence, there's these little buttons up here, which we will come back to um, in a minute. But uh, these are important to know what they do down the road. We'll talk more about them when we have some video in there. But first, let's begin the process of editing. So let's say you have your storyboard and you know exactly what shot you want to start with. And for me, I'm trying to remember 
what footage I have here that's good. I got some geese here, a little bit of awkward shot. Um, I like to always just kind of open the, my clips in Premiere and kind of cruise around and see what I've got. These geese on the lawn I like. Um, here I have a pan down. That's a really nice shot. Um, got a selfie shadow, and I've got the Richard Serra sculpture. So very seldom when you're editing, do you just bring in the whole clip to your timeline, right? You could probably see why that would be a problem. Like it's gonna be hard to start stitching together and cutting this together when everything's kind of, kind of crammed in here. So I'm just gonna delete that. And the way we wanna think about editing is what's called three-point editing. Um, Let's go ahead and take our geese and start here. So this clip is a minute long, over a minute long. I don't want this whole thing. I want to find like a nice choice part to edit in. Three-point editing allows us to set what's called an in point and an out point for a clip that we're then going to take only that selection and edit it into the timeline. So for instance, if I go to markers and mark in or hit the I button, watch what happens. A little marker gets set there. And if I hit the space bar, my video plays at normal speed. And I can kind of feel out how long I want this shot to be. So maybe since those people just left this, the frame, I'll stop it there. And I want to make my out point there or hit O. And when I do that, you see just this little area is selected. And if I hit the up key and the down key, it hops between the in point and the out point. Um, and my arrow keys, if I hit the left key, it goes frame by frame. And if I hit the right key, or sorry, the left key, it goes backwards. So you can kind of get frame accurate and kind of get super precise. Like if I want to back it up, until exactly the point they leave the frame, I can do that right there and then make this my new out point by hitting O. So now here I have just this little area. So we've got two of the three points for three point editing. The third point comes with our destination. So this is the part of the clip I want. And now that I've selected just this, this little section, you'll notice that my duration has changed from over a minute to eight seconds. And this is because it's telling me how long my selection is, which I really like. So let's say that we're gonna start our, this is gonna be our first shot. We might put the playhead right at the very beginning of the video. And then this is where you can edit it into the sequence. And there's a few ways you can do it. You can simply drag your video down into the timeline. Um, I'm going to hit Command Z to undo that. Um, or what you can do is I would start to encourage you to start using down here these two buttons, which also have a keyboard shortcuts. Um, this insert edit is the comma, and this overwrite edit is the period. There is a slight distinction between those two things, which I'll come back to, but let's just hit insert. If I hit this button, it drops the audio and the video down to my sequence. If I hit Command Z, there we go. Let's say that I don't want the audio. If you only want the video, you can drag, click that area and drag just the video. And similarly, you can grab just the audio of a clip. So this is very helpful. Um, but I want the whole thing down there, so I'm just gonna hit the comma button and drop my clip in there, right? So three point editing, one, two, three, all right? And so now you just do this over and over to kind of get at where you're at. And as I mentioned, the up and down key hop you from any kind of like clip end or cut. So bouncing around your, your uh, sequence. So now I want to take my next clip. Let's see if I got some geese there. What would be a nice edit? Maybe I want to go down to this tree. And again, I want to sort of choose a section of this. So maybe I'll choose a section before it starts to move. So I'm gonna kind of just hit, I'm gonna hit I to make my endpoint. 
I had to feel it out. All right, and before it started to move, so I'm gonna back it up. Another helpful keyboard shortcut is if I wanna play something in reverse, if I hit the J key, it plays backwards. If I hit the L key, it plays forward. If I hit the K key, it's the stop. So J, K, L is a pretty handy trio of keyboard commands you might start to use. Also helpful is let's say you wanna like, sometimes you just scrub through your video just to kind of see what you got. Let's say you wanna play your video, but you wanna see what it looks like if it's moving twice as fast. If you hit L, that plays your video. If you hit L again, it plays it faster. If you hit L again, it plays it even more fast. So every time you hit L, your video plays extra fast. So you can kind of cruise around and see what you've got. Um, you might start to like use only keyboard shortcuts to hop around your timeline, and that's totally cool. So I'm just gonna drag my playhead and just find the area before the camera starts to move. And again, I'm gonna come over here and hit my insert key. Now, you'll notice when I did that, the video went to video track one. But if I move this little blue area on the left, it's called our target track. If I move that to video two, and if I move this to audio two, watch what happens when I hit insert it drops the video onto that track. So this can be something you start to use as you get more sophisticated with your editing. Um, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here just to show you what we got going on. So again, my up key hops me through. And so now I can kind of have a, a spatial representation of what I've got going on. My first shot is eight seconds. My next shot is about two. And so I'm just gonna hit mute. And so I don't have that noise. So I can kind of see what my edit's about to look like. And then we go, it stops at black. So I'm just gonna add one more shot. Maybe we wanna have uh, Richard Serra in here, his little sculpture. So again, I'm just kind of cruising through and I'm gonna maybe, I don't want anyone walking through. So I'm gonna start it in the beginning, hit I. I'm gonna play it, feel it out. Hit O, I've got about a four second shot, and I'm gonna put that back on video one, and I'm gonna drop it in there, all right? Another, um, as you can see, I'm zooming in and out on my clips with by dragging this little uh, like roller bar, but another keyboard shortcut I find very helpful is the plus minus button. It's like zooming in and zooming out, uh, super helpful. And you'll notice that Right now I'm working on my sequence so it has this blue outline. That's how you know what window is active. So for instance, if I have my program active, it's blue. If I'm like editing in here and looking in here, this area is blue. And if I hit the plus minus keys, this zooms in. So anyways, you might just kind of, something to keep in mind as you're working around Premiere, right? All right, cool. So. Three-point editing, super kind of basic, super uh, foundational, but super important, right? So try to kind of work with in-points and out-points. Um, but just because you've done that doesn't mean what we have here is set in stone. Let's say, for instance, that you feel like this first shot is way too long. No problem. Uh, a few ways to fix this. You can probably start thinking about it. One is I have my selection tool activated. I can simply come over here and just change the duration by coming to the beginning or end of the clip and dragging it to a certain point. You'll notice that like uh, something called snapping is in effect. Like if you have your playhead in a certain area, the clip will kind of want to snap into place. I find that to be very helpful, but um, it helps kind of give you this frame accuracy. So for, in for instance, if you wanted to like, if you were doing like a metric thing and you wanted your first clip to be exactly five seconds, we could go and get, using our arrow key, find five seconds exactly, and then boom, change the duration, right? So that's one way to do it. Um, 
Another way to do it is, so as you've noticed, you click a clip in your browser window and you see it in your, up here, you see what you're working with. Um, but if you have a clip in your sequence and you want to kind of like maybe change the duration or change what it is, if you double click a clip from your timeline, it opens it in the source window and then allows you to make changes to that. So I'm just gonna zoom out a little bit. And here, this gray area is my clip. And remember, there's all this extra footage I didn't use because that clip is one minute long. So if I, for instance, came in here, put my playhead here and hit O for out and made a new out point, watch how the clip in the timeline reacts to what I'm doing up here in my source window. See how that changed? That's because when you double click a clip and you start working on it in your source window, it's an active edit, so it changes. And it does not change the original clip. If I come here and I double click from my source, my project window, it brings up the original. And even though you see this in and out point, I can reset my in and out point and it doesn't affect my clip. That might be a little bit confusing, but I think it probably makes sense. All it means is that you can draw different sections from your one clip. You can be editing multiple sections from that one clip into your sequence here. So for instance, if I wanted to um, put this other shot at the end of my Richard Sarah, and I came over, I could, for instance, let's see, I've got a five second shot, and since I want this to be maybe five seconds, I'm gonna back it up 12. So now it's five seconds exactly, and I'm gonna drop it in there. And so now I've gotten Richard Sarah back to the geese, right? And you can see what's going on here. I'm starting to develop my clips. And because I changed this, I have this big gap. Um, so a few ways to kind of deal with this. Um, using your selection tool, you can just grab all of these and move them around. Or another kind of helpful tool I want to share is the track select key. So you'll notice you hold it down and you've got track select forward and track select backwards. So since I want to move a bunch of footage that's all downstream or looking forward, if I select that clip, I now have this double arrow kind of selection. And basically, anywhere to the right of where I click is selected. So this is really helpful for like moving chunks of media in your timeline to kind of like buttress them uh, back into place. If I hold the shift button down, it makes it a single arrow and it only selects the one track that I'm selecting. So since I want to have all of these and I'm going to buttress this here, I'm just going to select it all, move it back, and now I've got my edit kind of happening. All right, looking great. But I'm going to go back and go back to my move tool because I always like to have that on default so I don't make any mistakes. All right. Three-point editing with some basic tools. Um, let me show you the, the razor blade tool real quick, as you may have guessed. If you wanted to, another way to like shorten a clip, if you wanted to like cut a clip up, let's say you wanted to like remove uh, like a sort of like every other like half second or something. If you wanted to kind of do some kind of flicker film, for instance, you could come in here and cut up the clip and then use, go back to your move tool and start to just delete these spaces. And then you have some kind of like blinking effect or what have you, but you kind of understand uh, what I'm getting at, how that tool could be used. Um, pretty helpful. Um, and you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna just move this up to the second track. I'm also going to move my audio to the second track. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like 
over exaggerating this type of editing right now what I'm doing with like alternating between track one and track two but I call this is something called checkerboarding or sometimes it's referred to checkerboarding but it's a way that I like to work um, when you start getting in here you start to like get your own system but for me uh, this can be really helpful because uh, it's it gives distinctions to the clips but it also allows you to like start to maybe have more flexibility again Let's say that like this first shot, I'm, I'm kind of liking, and then I cut to this, this branch, but I'm like, oh, I wish this lasted longer. When I have these alternating, I can do something, for instance, I could just come in here, double click this, and maybe I want this to be a little bit longer, so I, it's gonna start to move now. And maybe I'll just hit out, and there we go. Now I have this whole kind of move which starts, which will then stop with Richard Sarah, right? So I could kind of like feel this out. Maybe it's a little bit too long. I can just shorten it, start to feel that. But having things on alternating video tracks is really helpful for this kind of, um, this kind of like editing style. I, I find it to be very helpful, to be honest. All right, um, cool. So one thing I haven't done yet that I want to encourage you all to do is to save your projects, which is Command S but I like to say save early and save often. Um, I haven't gone into the preferences. I feel like that's something maybe you should look at yourself, but there's an auto save setting in the preferences, which maybe I'll do it really quick here. Inside Premiere Pro, preferences, general, um, pulls up all this stuff. You came in here when you were doing your default still duration, which you might want to change back. Um, for instance, mine is back at 10 seconds. You might want to put this back. But under autosave, um, you definitely want this highlighted. Um, I don't know what yours is defaulted to, but automatically save every 15 minutes and saving 20 versions. So in your autosave vault, you're going to have 20 different versions in the case of some kind of disaster. Some people go crazy and automatically save every five minutes. But uh, I feel confident enough in my, my kind of neurotic saving that I don't um, have it set to a very like, short duration. But this is up to you. Um, but in general, like, you might want to just poke at these, and maybe we'll look at those um, another time. But OK, so I'm going to come back to this real quick and talk about transitions. So Premiere works in a sort of like track hierarchy. Whatever is on top is visible. So you'll notice um, since this tree shot is on top, it over, it dominates the track next to it. If I was to remove that, the Sarah clip is visible. I'm going to undo. Um, but let's talk about opacity and transition. So right now, my uh, I'm looking at my timeline and all my clips are pretty skinny. Um, if you just come over here and you sort of find the little area and you kind of open up your tracks, you get a little bit more space. It, it's cramped, but when you open them up, you start to notice this line, right? And it, that wasn't there before with both your audio and your video track. Um, but when you open the tracks and make them appear taller that appears if you're not seeing like if you open this up pretty significantly and you're not seeing this line on your audio or video come over to the wrench timeline display settings and um same thing with your audio this like jaggedy kind of looking uh like white area that's called a waveform it's a visual representation of your audio um if you're not seeing that uh, you might also have to come in here to this wrench. But basically what you want um, to see in this case is the audio waveform and audio keyframes. Um, you want those visible. And same thing with video keyframes. Like if I deselect show video keyframes, that line disappears. And that's bad. I'll show you why in a minute. So have that line visible. Again, it's not visible if your track is a certain height. It's a little confusing, but that is that. So another tool I want to point out that I love is the pen tool. 
So um, the pen tool has a few other things underneath it, but we're interested in the pen tool. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. The pen tool is how we make keyframes. And in this case, because I'm looking at my video and my audio, um, the keyframes we make are going to have to do with opacity and audio volume. So for instance, you can hear someone talking over that a little bit. And also you have this hard cut, but if I wanted to do fade out my video and the audio at the same time, I have to come in here with my pen tool and using the playhead as a guide, um, you just click on that wireframe to make a keyframe. And it's kind of, think of it as like a pivot point or a joint. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fade out the video by making two keyframes. That's the first one where the fade will begin. And the second one is where the fade will end. And I can move, once I've made the keyframe, I can move it around. I can have it be a really short fade out. Or I can have it be a really long, slow fade out. And that's why I like the pen tool because it gives you this kind of control, right? Um, you'll notice that under, uh, well, there are a bunch of default transitions, which we'll get to in a minute, but um, I love this pen tool, it gives you more control. So that's something you might wanna do. And, but be careful because if you wanna move, for instance, let's say that the volume here is too soft. You, you wanna up the whole volume. You don't need to use the pen tool. You can just use the arrow tool and just raise the volume to a, a level that's desirable. This is gonna be very loud. And you can see how it peaked, so I would not want it to be that high. Um, but yeah, so you can move, you can change the opacity without the pen tool, but the pen tool allows you to animate it and have it kind of like come in and out. So again, if I wanted, as I have a blink here, a hard blink, if I wanted it to end in a soft blink, I could zoom in really close and using my pen tool every few frames, just make a bunch of keyframes and then come down here and you can kind of tell what I'm doing here and have it be like more of a flicker, right? So pen tool, very handy. You'll probably use it most for your audio fade in and fade outs. Um, and that's one thing to keep in mind, like the power of a fade in, whether it's a slow one or a fast one, right? Um, so yeah, cool. So speaking of fade-ins, let's find a default transition for our audio. So I could use my pen tool, as I've encouraged you all to do. Um, and what I did, I just select my all track, and I just gave myself a little bit of black here at the beginning. So that we're not starting right on the first frame of the video. And let's say I just wanna have a gentle fade-in. So if I go in my, uh, project window, if I hit the effects tab, this is where all the video and audio transitions and effects live. They're all kind of like buried in here. Um, but for instance, video transition, this is going to be where you would find some really fun stuff like a page peel or uh, an iris or a zoom or a wipe, things like that. Um, they're kind of, kind of funny. Um, and same thing with audio. So if you were trying to like add reverb, you could kind of come on here and just like literally drag your, uh, your filter on there. Um, but I'm looking for a transition right now. So apply video transition and apply audio transition. So, um, these are sort of defaults. So if I, let's, let's give myself an audio transition here. If I click that, it gives me an automatic crossfade. And that's the same thing that I could have just simply dragged over. Uh, but I was kind of showing you how everything is sort of in two places at once. 
Um, so I'm going to undo that. And for instance, um, crossfade. Uh, I the difference between these is sort of minimal, to be honest. But um, constant power is kind of a good one uh, just to kind of use. But um, you'll hear the slight difference as you kind of use them. But let's hear what this looks like now. So that's a very subtle fade in, right? And so, but if I double click my audio transition, it's 10 frames long. So if I make it two seconds and 10 frames, it's a little bit slower of a fade in. And there we go. Okay. Okay, there you have it. So I'm gonna save again. So here we are, we're editing, we're, we're making our dope video. Um, everything is looking pretty good so far. Um, but there's a few other things. See, when I edited this little flickery zone, it also cut out my audio. So what I want ideally is that audio to kind of remain, but you'll notice the audio and the video are what's called linked. And so let me show you how to unlink audio and video. If you highlight a clip and you control click or right click, you get this whole menu going on. And this is a lot of other things we're gonna get into during the semester. But what's imp one important thing to point out is the unlink. You're gonna be doing this a lot. N normally you want your audio and your video linked or synced up but sometimes you want to just you know separate them and do some kind of editing like this so if, if I click unlink now when I click the audio it does its own thing and when I click the video it does its own thing and that's great whereas all these for instance are still linked together so I could select them all and then right click and unlink them all together and delete them and then just stretch this out that gives me this kind of like you know like more of a feeling of sonic presence instead of just having the audio and the video kind of like totally locked and this is something we want to encourage you to think about when you're editing is like this idea of a sound mix and layering sound and the sounds you hear don't always have to be perfectly connected in reality to the images we see. And so that's why like you, when you're on set, people talk about recording room tone and just recording the sound of nature because people will take those and put them in, like drop them in down here as like a sound bed as you're editing. So very helpful. Okay. So let's pull up another clip. I'm gonna, um, go back to where my clips are over here in my project tab. And now I've got this nice long tilt down, but I feel like that's a little bit too slow. So let me show you the rate stretch tool down here under, oops, where is it? Under this third one, this ripple edit, you find rate stretch. This actually is super simple and in some ways just dangerously easy to use. But let's say you want this shot to move faster. You just would come here and once you've got your shot, you just crunch it and squeeze it. And basically what happens is, it changes the speed of your playback. And you can tell right here that I've almost doubled it from 100%, which is normal, to 190%. So this, this clip is now playing back at twice the speed, including the audio. So this would be another thing where, for instance, if I wanted to unlink, if I wanted the audio to stay normal speed, I would unlink, then I would come over, grab my rate stretch tool, and only get 
the video, come back to my move tool, drag it here. It's a little unnatural, so I want to slow it down a little bit more. Uh, But you'll see how the audio playing at normal speed gives it the illusion that it's like not super sped up. So, all right, I'm just gonna come over here and shorten my audio. So I've got that. And actually, you know what? I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna leave it here. So right now my video ends when my audio keeps going. And now this is where I wanna insert a shot in and show you the difference between insert and overwrite. So for instance, let's just take Maybe so we can, the shot where we can kind of see the camera. And there we have about a two second shot. So let's say I want to drop that shot right in the middle of this shot. Now I have two options. I can either do an insert, which is going to drop the shot in here and push the original shot, the, palm, the pan down, over so we don't lose any footage. Versus an overwrite is just gonna dump it right on top and it will overwrite or block all the footage so we'll lose part of that clip, the pan, the pan down. So let me show you what I would do. I would say, I would come over here and lock my audio. These locks are very helpful if you're trying to like maybe do an edit where you don't want the audio to move but you do want the video to move. So for instance, I've locked my audio track and I hit this insert edit and watch, and this is also where I'm gonna come over here and I'm just gonna change my target track to video one and audio two and I'm gonna hit insert. And you'll see what happened. See how it inserted that right into the middle of this shot? So let's see how that looks. All right, so it kind of like pauses the pan down, inserts this shot, and then picks it up where we left off. If I undo that and I choose the overwrite, watch what happens. It just dumps it right in there and disregards anything that is in its path, like bulldozes it, if you will. So I kind of like that. I might just bump it over so it's a little bit more centered here, but there you have it. So the difference between insert and overwrite, super uh, important to know the difference, but also to use them in a way that benefits you, right? So, okay. All right, so I just saved. So we have now covered three-point editing, um, a few of the many tools that you have that I think are super important. Um, We've covered uh, like the very basic of transitions with the pen tool. I do just want to kind of point out some of these like little things. I'm assuming you're all familiar with like an eyeball. For example, the eyeball means is a track visible or not. Um, the lock locks it, and you can't do any. It will not, nothing will get uh, affected if you do an insert edit or anything. Um, anytime you add tracks, just make sure that these are blue. Um, it only happens when you add tracks and you can do that under uh, sequence, add tracks or delete tracks. Um, you can also just simply add tracks by literally just dragging video up. So you'll see I just created this. As you add these tracks, just make sure you highlight them right there. All right. So I'm going to just use an overwrite edit and put this right there. And maybe, since this is so loud, I'm just gonna come down here and just get ready. Oops, this is also very loud. Pen tool. So for instance, if you want to do a really short little transition, um, thinking about 
how long with the pen tool, how long and fast a fade exists. Uh, so something to keep in mind. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, a seven frame fade out pretty fast. You might want to do, since that, since that uh, camera pan was like nice and smooth, you might, might want a little bit of a longer, slower transition. And then we don't want no sound. So even though this is very obnoxious, uh, I'll bring it up just a little bit. All right. So you can tell, even though it's not very high, the view meter is up here and it's kind of loud. Uh, you generally want to keep your audio around negative 12 decibels if possible. Like that should be like where it's kind of like living uh, during any speech or primarily primary audio information. Um, like ambient sound should not be that loud. Uh, but this all comes into your sound mix and we'll talk more about sound mixing. Right now, we're thinking more about just like, um, kind of like the more of a macro perspective um, instead of these micro kind of things about like sound mix and levels, but keep that in mind. All right, so I wanna talk real quickly about effects. And one thing that for instance, you might wanna find yourself doing is looking at these, these video effects. Um, and one thing that I like to play around with is for instance, um, like the transitions. And you'll notice that transitions have a few, like there's a video transitions folder, and then there's like a transition folder inside of video effects. It's a little confusing, but basically Premiere distinguishes effects from transitions um, same with thing with audio. So, um, but video effects are kind of pre-established um, things. And so you might just poke around in here um, and look at what we have. So for instance, a mirror effect, um, like a, a, a warp stabilizer, um, a magnify uh, filter. Um, you're also gonna find some color correction stuff in here. Um, but let me just, maybe let's choose uh, a mosaic, for instance. So for, let's say if I wanna like use a mosaic effect on here, if I bring it over here, I just drag it onto my clip and then this is what the effect looks like. But it doesn't just stop there. If I double click, again, anytime you double click a clip in this area, you bring it into your source window and you have the power to edit it. So what I wanna do is I don't wanna change the duration I think it's like good as is, but I do want to mess around with the effects controls. And so this is where I added my mosaic filter. If I hit this little FX button, it's kind of the on off switch. I can see what it looks like without the filter and then with the filter. So for instance, I can change the amount of horizontal and vertical blocks by kind of like using this draggy kind of thing. So you can kind of like, this is where you can kind of give yourself like a, you could generate like fake pixelated kind of looking footage. Um, it could also be some fun thing where you're like blurring out, um, you know, people's faces using masks and things like that. I don't want to get too deep into effects right now, but just, just knowing basically like how to add the effects and then like how to come in here and change them um, is I think a really good beginning. So, um, and let's say that you're like, okay, that mosaic filter was not as cool as I thought. Um, again, I'm looking at it without. Um, you can either just unselect it and keep it there, or you can delete it by hitting, uh, like highlighting the word and just hitting the delete button. And now it's gone. Um, so there we have it. So, but one thing that is good to think about, um, even though it's not truly an effect, for every clip in your sequence, um, the effects control tab is pretty important. You probably aren't gonna come in here like every time, but you'll notice the default motion effects, opacity, and time remapping are up here. And so for instance, motion includes 
position, scale, rotation, and some other things that aren't super crucial right now. So this is filling up our frame, right? And that's how we want it. But if I change the scale of my clip to, let's call it 50%, it changes the size of my clip, right? And so this would be an area where you could play around with if you want to do picture in picture or split screen. Um, and also the position. If you kind of mouse over and you drag left and right, uh, it keeps everything on a very like tight, like gridded out position. And it can kind of help you move things around in a way that is a little bit easier to kind of set up something. So like for instance, if I was doing a two screen, I could kind of set this up. I could um, come over here and find another shot. And so let me show you something about three point editing that's cool. So you know that we're making in points and out points and editing it in. But let's say I want this shot to be exactly, I'm gonna add a second shot on the left here. If I want to be exactly the same duration, if I hit I for in and then go to the end and hit O for out, I've got an in point and an out point in my sequence. And then what I could do is I could find, for instance, a place that I really want to have in my shot. So let's say I like that this kind of ends with, like we have these people walking, we have, and we have these geese walking. Maybe I want it to kind of end here. If I make this my out point, and then I go here and I do a, I've made V3 my target, and I'm going to make audio three my target so that I'm not overwriting anything and I just do overwrite it now adds this footage exactly to my to my likings and now I can double click this clip of the geese go to effects controls I know it, it needs to be 50% scale and now I just need to move the position over and I've got a pretty good picture in picture, but I can tell um, by looking, I'm gonna zoom in, but I can tell it's not perfect. So in your window here, you have this little fit button. That's probably where it starts. If you, this is your kind of like zoom in or out view. It doesn't affect what you're seeing on screen. It's just a view mode. So it's like, for me, I'm zooming in to like, a hundred so I can get this really precise and I'm coming over here and I'm going to just position this exactly to match the other one so that's my position I'm going to put this back to fit and now I can see my full frame so if I go to for instance 25 percent uh, like if I had things hanging off I could kind of see them here so Fit is good. This area where it says full, this is your playback resolution. If your video, if your computer seems like it's lagging and your video is playing back choppy, you can reduce your playback resolution to like half resolution and it will play back a little smoother. It will look less quality, but it doesn't impact your actual quality. All right, so there we have it. So we've just added this cool split screen um, but you know what? I don't really like, I actually, I feel like these two things need to be on the other side. So I'm just going to come over here and I'm just going to, oops, going to swap them out. And there we have it. So I've got my really cool shot. And maybe what I want to do is something keeping in mind with the audio. I don't like, it's a little noisy and loud. So maybe what I want to do is just have this kind of subtle impact where like, maybe I just have like a crossfade kind of happening where I just fade out one and fade 
in the other. And it's this kind of gentle little thing. But you can see, maybe I don't want that dead space there. So what I would do is I would just sort of, um, if I want my audio to come in before it's gone, I would just keep that in mind. And since this represents when it's all the way up and this represents when it's all the way down, I'll just kind of balance that out in my head. And there we have it. All right, cool. So this is opening up a whole world of what you can do with effects. Um, and I think it's definitely worth playing around with. Um, so I'm gonna save that again. Oh, and if you start to get cramped in here, definitely something's gonna happen. A nice keyboard shortcut is if the button under the escape, which is, it's called a tilde. It's like a little like, uh, it looks like this. Um, if you hit that button, it makes any window that you have highlighted full screen. So for instance, if I'm trying to work, doing some audio work in here and I need more space, this can be very helpful, but obviously you can't see your video at that same time um, and you just hit tilde to zoom to get back out. But um, I find myself using that all the time, especially like in this window when I have a lot of footage, right? So yeah, there we go. Um, so, all right. I think this is a lot, but it's cool because we're kind of like loading you up. So you kind of know how to... We've already talked about audio, but I'm just going to quickly add some sound to my awesome video by going to my music. And I'm just going to, again, make an in point and maybe an out point there. And because I'm only using the audio, this is a great, um, this is a great opportunity for me to come all the way back here to just grab the audio only and put it on a track that is, oops, unencumbered. So, but the music starts really late. So I'm just gonna come in here and just bring up my razor blade tool, get rid of this. And then add some music there. Um, And I think this needs more fades. So I'm just gonna kind of go in and this would be something that you know you would start to think about, but I'm just gonna kind of come there. And this is another reason doing the three-point editing is key because it gives you what you might call these handles. So like you're not starting your shot with the very first frame you recorded. You have all this extra footage that you can then kind of incorporate and use for transitions. Um, I think that that's, super important. Yes. And so using these waveforms is like very helpful. And let's say I was about to edit something and I wanted to sort of like make a move right when she started, uh, this is Karen Dalton, when she started singing. Yes. So I would come in here That's her saying yesterday beginning. So if I found that and I highlight this clip, if I go to uh, markers, if I go to add marker, um, this is a helpful tool. You can add a little marker inside of a clip. So for instance, by hitting M or going to add marker, right there on my clip, you can see, I now know exactly where she starts singing. So if I'm editing and I wanted to like, maybe have this shot end right at the marker, I could do that and I could come over here, grab my track selection and, oops. Then this, is, this would be an instance of where I need to lock my audio track because I wanna move everything but not the song. 
And then, there we go. And now I'm sort of like starting to edit to the music. And these waveforms allow you to edit to the beat of things as well. You can kind of see where like music swells. And maybe sometimes it's good to kind of have an edit start or end on those moments. Or maybe even kind of like put it in the middle. So we could, for instance, go back, use our move tool, and maybe we have this shot. But you get the idea, right? So this is not going to be a masterpiece. I'm not even going to try. Um, but I like the little things you've got going on here. So I've got a little, I've got some magic happening. Um, my audio is running a lot longer than the rest of my track. And that's something I would not want to kind of leave lingering when I was getting ready to finish up. Um, so I would either come and fade it out or chop it. But real quick, let's just talk about the text tool or the uh, type tool, as they call it because you definitely want to think about titles and credits. So um, with Premiere, it's actually kind of super easy these days. Um, you can put text over images or over space in your timeline where there's media. So if I came over here and just click on the screen as I did, it generates a piece of video that is in my timeline that's called graphic, but when I double click it uh, and I'm in the text tool, I should, under effects, for instance, just like I can affect the tra uh, other video clips, there is, under effects control, text information here. And this is where you choose your font. It starts you off with a really no good font. Um, let's try Gil Sands, why not? And this is the text where I would uh, type my dreams, what do I want to say? Um, let's call this, wow, what a movie. And then I could even come down here and say, by Eric Fleischauer. Um, and I could get a little bit fancy with this. I could, you know, just like any other thing, you gotta highlight the <clears throat> text and maybe I want to be semi-bold because I'm a semi-bold kind of person, just joking. I'm a regular type of person. So let's go there. Uh, you know, change my color. Uh, this is a lot of outdoor scene, so let's make it let's make it greeny, forest greenish. Uh, with maybe a stroke of autumn. Let's see how that looks. Um, I will tell you that the text tool is limiting, but we've got size here again. Um, this is why I don't like it. You got to highlight it and then kind of do this. Um, and then if I want to move that, you've got to come back here, use your regular tool and move this around, save it. But, but now I've got this, this is great. And I could even put that over a video clip. Maybe I'll just have it going over this amazing zoom. And I only want the video for this. I don't need that awesome audio. But... Wow, what an amazing thing. So, and then I would kind of just decide how I want this movie to end. Oh yeah, that's really great. Um, amazing. Kind of fade this out slowly. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna fade this out. Because why not? Sure. Oh, one thing I didn't mention is how to, let's say you've uh, made an extra, made like an extra keyframe here. If you right click, you can delete it that way um, by right clicking. Uh, you can also get into like Bezier curves and things like that. 
Uh, you can do ease in, ease out. We'll talk more about that later, but I encourage you to explore those. Um, I feel like this is a lot of information. Hopefully you found it helpful. And I'm going to encourage you to always leave a little bit of black at the end of your video. So right now, this fades to black, and there's also this audio where nothing's happening. So something you want to th remember is like, what happens when your movie ends? Does it just freeze on the last frame, or does it? do you want it to sit on black and let the viewers kind of like be sitting in the dark and pondering what we just saw? If you ever need to like add some black, just like some black video, I mentioned this earlier, but new black video or color mat can work. If we want to edit some color, um, we could, so I chose color mat. I'm going to click OK. And this could be where I, I don't know, what's a good color? Maybe we'll go with our um, hot pink. Yes. So, and I'm going to call this pink, and it's going to save it over here. And you'll notice it brings that up. But if I just drag this over, voila. I would make it about this length. And now see it's over that. So actually what I would want to do is just really quickly move that there. Think about my layer hierarchy. Bring this down. And then, ooh, I kind of got a nice little accidental. Oh, wow, what a pink ending. Get my pen tool and fade out that pink to black in the end just a little bit. All right, looking good. So I feel like, wow, what a masterpiece I've gotten here. The last thing we need to do, you should watch this in real time and look for any like mistakes, listen, like watch your view meter. And then when you're satisfied, choose your selection tool. Make sure there's nothing selected in the timeline. And you also wanna make sure there's no in and out points in your timeline. Um, because when you go to export, those things can cause you problems. So nothing selected, no in and out points. Go to File, Export, Media. And exporting is like a whole thing. You guys will all be um, kind of like doing not just this semester, but forever. Um, and there are a lot of kind of nuance and detail to this. But the main points are... I'm going to say for our purposes, the sort of like most efficient way to do this would be to choose H.264 as our format. Our preset brings up a lot of options. So we, if we left this same as source or match source, it would make a pretty large file. It would use the AVC HD codec. Um, but because we want to kind of like, we're going to be uploading this to either Vimeo or YouTube, I would recommend choosing one of those presets. They're, they're pretty good. Vimeo's is actually pretty good, even if you're not uploading to Vimeo. Um, and this would be where like, for instance, you're choosing 1080p or 720p. Let's choose YouTube full HD setting. So H.264 and then whatever preset you're choosing, uh, always make sure export video and export audio are selected. Um, another important thing is what is the title and where is it going? So we would call this, uh, let's, I'll call it my movie, but this would be again where I would send it to my documents folder and I would find that folder I made and I would just put it straight in there, see it with, so that everything is together and then I would click save. Go ahead, you can also select maximum render quality, especially if you're doing effects. Um, but for the most part, you would just hit export when you're ready. But the last thing to check is this preview. So I would just kind of like drag this along and make sure this looks like what we have, right? And this would be where like, for instance, if you accidentally like left a clip selected, this might say something like custom. Basically, you're going to be selecting either entire sequence um, or work area. Uh, let's go with entire sequence. 
for the, uh, unless you have some weird things happening that should do you right. And it tells me that my whole video is 51 seconds and three frames, which sounds about right. There's some black at the beginning and black at the end, which I love. So I'm ready to go. So I would just hit export and it's going to process and send it out. All right, so now if I go and hide Premiere and I open under Documents, Editing Demo, there's my movie. And voila, there it is. So you can tell it is 1920 by 1080 with H.264 codec. You might start to notice certain quality differences depending on what codecs you're using. And if something looks wrong when you export, definitely go back and check your settings. But this looks great. Good luck and enjoy. Have a great evening.